we're back for episode 1.6. Our episode begins with Ned waking up after being injured in his fight with Jamie. What's missing is Ned's Tower of Joy dream. This is an infamous dream that is often talked about by book fans and argued about. Essentially, the dream is a flashback to the end of Robert's rebellion. Ned and his companions have finally located Liana in a tower, and she's guarded by three Kingsguard. In a seven-on-three fight, Ned's group wins, and Ned finds Liana in a bed of blood. Many fans, including me, conclude that this means that Liana was giving birth. Anyway, Liana dies, and they find Ned, and then Ned tears down the tower somehow and buries his friends there. The reason this dream is talked about and argued about so much is that there are a lot of unanswered questions, and the dream doesn't seem to make too much sense. For example, Liana was giving birth that exact day? And why were the Kingsguard defending outside the tower? And why didn't they spirit her away or try to negotiate with Ned? And how and why did they bring down the tower? And who are the they that found Ned? And why didn't Ned bring his friends' bodies home, ever? And who was supplying food to this place? And who fed this supposed baby that Ned traveled with? But of course, the big question is, who is this baby, or babies? I think it's Danny, many think it's John, some think both, other think Aegon and Mira are in the mix. And of course, a really big question is, who sent this dream to Ned, and why? Whoever sent this dream, it seems to have the effect of keeping Ned in King's Landing. If you remember, prior to this dream, Ned was furious with Robert over the issue of assassinating Danny. Ned was dead set on leaving King's Landing. But after this dream, he stays for some reason. Now, I believe this means that Danny must be connected to the Tower of Joy in some way. Others aren't so convinced and think that perhaps Ned's broken leg or Robert's pressure or Robert's threat to make Jamie Lannister hand had something to do with it. Whatever the case, in the book, dreams are a huge factor in why Robert and Ned's friendship breaks down. Robert dreams of killing Targaryens. Ned dreams of Targaryen babies. There's a fundamental conflict between these two men's dreams. Off in the Dothraki Sea, we're treated to this extra scene of Danny not burning her hands on an egg. Now this makes it look like Danny is biologically special and can't be burned, and explains why she's not burned in the pyre later on. In the book, this issue is a little more complicated, and fans have debates about how fireproof Danny is. We know from the Duncan Egg books that Targaryens do have some resistance to heat, but later on, Danny does suffer burns at the hands of her dragons. So the question remains. How did Danny survive the pyre? No one really knows. Perhaps Danny's dragon dreams have something to do with it, or maybe Miri Mazdor cast a spell, or maybe Danny has some sort of subconscious pyrokinesis, or maybe Danny is just the chosen one. We have yet to find out why Danny is sometimes fireproof. Next we have Bran dreaming about the Three Eyed Crow. Now in the book, Bran's dreams are significantly different. He dreams about flying around, a windowless tower, stone lions, a golden man, and I think it's an open question on whether or not Bran's dreams actually predict the future, or if someone just wants Bran to think that his dreams predict the future. Now this particular dream has the Three-Eyed Crow flying through what seems to be the crypts of Winterfell. Now in the book, this dream happens after Ned dies, so it's not prophetic at all. But it makes Bran think that his dreams are prophetic, as the dream happens before the Raven arrives with news of Ned's death. Having this dream before Ned dies changes the story quite a bit. Now next we're treated to this extra scene between Theon and Rob, where Theon eggs Rob into war. Now neither Rob nor Theon have points of view in A Game of Thrones. We only hear about this conversation secondhand, but it's very clear that both Rob and Theon needed some more screen time. Here Bran wanders off, but in the book it's actually Theon who takes all of the guards to chase a wild turkey. Theon is definitely more of an arrogant yet insecure fuck-up in the book. Bran is captured by some wildlings, but if you look, you'll actually notice that these wildlings have black cloaks. Some of them are Night's Watch deserters. Now why Osha has been hanging out with Night's Watch deserters is not really explained. Additionally, the wildlings seem to know who Benjen Stark is. Perhaps these were some of Benjen's men? Now the men suggest that they should kill Bran, but Osha thinks that they should take him to Mance. Now I'm not sure if Osha was trying to save Bran's life, or if she actually thought it was a good idea to bring Bran to Mance. Everyone in the party, including Osha, is scared to death of the White Walkers. So either she was just trying to save a little boy, or she really thought Starks were important to Mance's plans. Now Rob arrives, but he can't really do anything because Bran is a hostage. In the book, there's a little more tension because the wolves are there, and the wildlings ask Rob to kill the wolves. Luckily, Theon saves everyone. Now even though Rob chews Theon out, this is actually a big reason why Rob trusts Theon in A Clash of Kings. 
Of course, Ra being secretly appreciative of Theon is never communicated to Theon, and this adds to Theon's resentment of the Starks. Over in the Eyrie, we have Tyrion suffering in his sky cell. Now in the book, his sky cell is only five feet wide. Additionally, the floor slants towards the opening. The cells torture the captives until they jump. Back in King's Landing, we have a lesson between Arya and Sirio Farrell. What's interesting about the book is we don't actually get to see Sirio very much. We see him just at the beginning of their first lesson, and we see him at their last lesson. Almost everything else we know about Sirio is from Arya saying, Sirio says this, Sirio says that. It makes him a very, very mysterious character. Over in the Dothraki Sea, Danny is eating her giant horse heart. And she does this while the crones of Vase Dothrak speak of prophecy. In the show, Jorah translates, and Viserys is worried about Danny having a boy. In the book, Viserys has already written off Danny, and he's been drinking and talking to traitors for the last few days. Also in the book, Viserys seems to believe that the prophecy is a mummer's farce, so he's not so worried about it. His turning point was when Danny hit him, and he realized he couldn't control her anymore. Drogo congratulates Danny on her successful dinner, and actually in the book has sex with her right there in front of everybody. But that's how the Dothraki roll. Now we have this interesting scene where Viserys tries to steal the dragon eggs. Now in the book, Daenerys is the only point of view in the Dothraki Sea, so we don't actually know if Viserys tried to steal the dragon eggs. Jorah reports that Viserys tried to steal the dragon eggs, but I think it's an open question to whether Viserys actually did it. After all, Jorah is a big liar. Now back in the Eyrie, Tyrion bribes Mord to send a message to Lysa. And Tyrion is given the opportunity to confess. Now if you notice, Lysa and Sweet Robin's throne to rule the Vale is a werewood. Now this is interesting as werewoods don't grow in the Eyrie. The soil is far too thin. This means that the Andals dragged this werewood throne all the way up to the Eyrie for some reason, even though they don't worship the old gods. It also makes Sweet Robin very similar to Bran. They are both the sons of Tullys. They are both seen as too sickly or weak to rule. They both sleep a lot and are obsessed with flying, and they both have werewood thrones. So Tyrion confesses his crimes, although in the show they are much more vulgar than they are in the book. Now Lysa wants justice for Tyrion. And what's interesting is that in the book, Catelyn actually thinks that a trial is a bad idea. Apparently she had come to her senses and realized that this was heading to war. Now interestingly, Lysa chooses a rather old champion in the book to fight, which makes one wonder, did she want Tyrion to live? Considering that Lysa is scared to death of war, it seems likely that she actually wanted Tyrion to win. After all, why would she want to provoke the Lannisters? Now we get this extra scene of Robert hunting in the woods with Renly, Lancel, and Barristan. Robert starts taunting his younger brother, saying that he should have had sex with one girl from each of the Seven Kingdoms. And he weirdly asks Barristan if he's had sex with a girl from every kingdom. Of course, Barristan hasn't had sex in 40 years, if at all. And we get to learn a little bit more about Renly. He thinks the good old days stunk. Meanwhile, back in King's Landing, we get this very cryptic and very important scene. Essentially, Eddard is tricked into starting a war. Now in the book, the scene happens as follows. Raymond Derry, the same lord that observed Eddard and Robert have a tiff at his castle, arrives with a couple other river lords and some peasants. Although their stories contradict quite a bit, they essentially claim that the mountain attacked their villages, even though their villages are outrageously far from each other. Based on these very weak testimonies, Eddard decides that the mountain must be brought to justice. Loras volunteers to be part of the justice crew, but Eddard denies him, and Varys is baffled. Which makes me wonder, was it a Varys setup? Now in the show, peasants again claim that the mountain burned their villages. But this time it's Littlefinger that seems to be pressuring Eddard into war. Loras doesn't appear, and like in the book, Eddard orders Beric Dondarrion to take care of the mountain. Now of course, Beric is later killed by the mountain and resurrected. But imagine, it was almost Loras. There was almost a Stark Tyrell alliance and an undead Loras. Now back in the Eyrie, Bronn wins his fight and Tyrion repays his debt to Mord the Jailer. But interestingly, in the book, the debt isn't fully repaid. He actually tells Mord to come to Casterly Rock for the rest of the money. I do wonder if the Mord Tyrion story is over yet. Now back in King's Landing, Sansa is still depressed. Now in the book, Sansa is much happier in King's Landing. After all, her best friend Jane Poole is there, and Sansa is a big fan of all the knights and songs and pageantry. The show makes her depressed about Lady for a long time. To make Sansa turn around her emotions, the show adds this extra scene where Joffrey apologizes for being bad, and he gives her this locket which weirdly appears in season 5 on Marcella. None of this happens in the book, and I'm not sure what to make of it. I think it's just a goof. And up in Winterfell we get this extra scene between Roz and Theon because I guess the show needed some more TNA. Now back in King's Landing, Eddard tells his daughters that they're going to leave the city. 
Sansa is furious and tells Eddard that she loves Joffrey and that Joffrey is nothing like the king. Eddard has an oh my god moment and checks the book of lineages. Joffrey has golden hair while Baratheons have black hair. Now it should be noted that in the book, Eddard's research is a tad more rigorous. He checks every time in history a golden haired Lannister married a Baratheon. Every time the black won out over the gold. Show Eddard's work is a little more shoddy. What if all those Baratheon wives all had black hair? And our final scene is Viserys confronting Khal Drogo. Now I'd like to talk about how set up Viserys is in this situation. Now first off, Viserys is drunk. But earlier in the book, we actually find out that Viserys doesn't have any money. So who gave him the money to drink? He is also under the impression that no one can harm him. Who gave him that idea? Again, the only ones that speak the common tongue are Eri, Jiqui, Daria, and Jorah. Now in the book, Danny tries to defuse the situation by saying that Viserys can have the eggs. But Jorah never delivers that message, and he only translates escalating comments. One wonders how a man who was so craven that he ran away from his sister is now standing up to Khal Drogo. Is it just the courage of alcohol, or was Viserys provided some very bad information? Now weirdly, Daenerys does not feel any emotion over the death of Viserys. And later in the book, she doesn't feel any emotion over the death of her stillborn child either. Daenerys is not being cruel here. Someone somewhere, somehow, is messing with Daenerys' emotions. Now Viserys is crowned in gold. What's interesting is he's not the only person to end up this way. Leaders of a sellsword company called the Golden Company would have their skulls covered in gold after their death. The first man to do this was Bittersteel, the rival of Bloodraven. Now we know that Bloodraven likes to get inside people's heads, mostly through dreams. So I wonder, were these men trying to protect the knowledge that was inside their skulls? And if so, is Viserys' knowledge also protected? Or does the gold do something else to these men's souls? At this point in our story, we have far too little information to know. And that's episode 1.6. See you in episode 1.7.